Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the first panel of Vux.con. Uh, for those who might not know the term, blending genre, uh, genres or cross genre, it happens when you mix themes and or elements from two or more different genres. Science fantasy is an example, as is Weird West, a mixture of horror and western. But before we start, could everyone introduce themselves, please? Sure. I am Ava J. I'm the author of Beyond the Red, which released in March, and it's a young adult fantasy, what am I saying, fantasy, science fiction novel about an uprising on a distant alien planet that threatens the reign of a teen alien queen. Catherine, don't tell Louise I did that. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, so I, I'm Heidi. I'm the author of The Girl From Everywhere, and I didn't even think to bring my book from the next room, but imagine I'm holding it just like I <laughs> did. Um, and it's a time travel historical fantasy um, about pirates and a heist in Hawaii in the 19th century. Oh, me. Um, <laughs> like, I was like, oh, Laura's next, because I'm really good at the alphabet. Um, my name is Catherine Locke. I wrote a new adult series uh, called the District Ballet Series which starts with second position, and next year my first young adult book comes out, it's called The Girl with the Red Balloon, and it is also a time travel historical fantasy, much lighter on the fantasy and time travel than Heidi's book, though. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Laura, and I wrote Pantomime and Shadow Play, though these are now the old covers, and it has new pretty covers, and then my just released super shiny book, False Hearts, ooh, so shiny, <laughs> um, Pantomime, a historical fantasy, sci-fi, and fantasy drag thing with the circus, um, and the sequel has stage magic, and False Hearts is a near future sci-fi thriller with cults, brain hacking, and other fun stuff. Fun stuff. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is uh, Rin Chupeka, and I'm also the author of The Girl from the Well, and it's sequel The Suffering, and it's a horror literary fiction, and next year I am uh, due to release my new book, which is called The Bullet, and it's a modern fantasy literary fiction, against, uh, and it's going to be due out on March 2017. Awesome. Nice. Um, what is your personal experience with mixing genres, whether in books you've already published or manuscripts, short stories? Um, so what, the reason I said fantasy is because I was prepping for this question and that Beyond the Red, even though it's a science fiction novel, has a lot of fantasy elements in it. Um, so it's a very sci-fi setting, takes place on another planet, there are aliens and advanced technology, but it has a lot of tropes that you frequently see in fantasy, like monarchies and arranged marriage, marriage proposal stuff. So I've had um, a lot of readers even put it like under Goodreads shells as fantasy, and I've seen people reference it as fantasy, which is cool, but it is definitely science fiction with fantasy tropes in it. Yeah. Um. For me, my experience with mixing genres is um, like since it's, it's a histor it's a historical book that's very like the, the time travel is sort of fantasy based. It's not like a science fiction time travel, although time travel is often found in um, sci-fi. And uh, uh, so you have a, a lot of um, they they time travel using maps. So it seems like a more magical. Um, mode of time travel. And then, of course, the very historical elements because they travel to places straight out of history, like 19th century Hawaii. Um, so it's really a mishmash of those three genres, historical fantasy and the, the time travel sci-fi element that is not done in a sci-fi way at all. Um, I get really bored without magic in my books. <laughs> So I usually tend to start writing something that's strictly historical, and then I hit a point, usually about 30,000 words into a draft, where I'm like, wouldn't this be better with magic? <laughs> and then I go back and I rewrite the whole book <laughs> with magic. And so that's my experience, is that I was a reader who gravitated to fantasy, but I'm also somebody who's deeply interested in historical and political times in our history. So 
I looked at 1988 East Berlin and was like, that's a great time. Wouldn't it be awesome if they were helping people escape with magic? <laughs> Which is something tricky because you don't want to use magic to undermine things that happened in history that were real people's lives. East Germany was uh, a totalitarian state and many, many people suffered under it. So I don't want to use magic to undermine their experiences, but I do want to use magic to bring my reader into that space in a safe way. So that's kind of how I mix magic and history. Um, and basically every time I try to write something young adult, I end up writing magic in it. <laughs> Um, I sort of follow a similar thing in that it seems I can't I can't seem to write something without magic. I, all my book ideas so far are pretty speculative. Um, and pantomime, I initially queried it as adult sci-fi, which seems funny now. Uh, so I basically like imagine the world as history has started over again. So we're back in the Victorian era, but there's all these remnants from a really advanced civilization. And they might have been aliens, they might not. No one really knows what happened. And there are also these possible mythical creatures called the Chimera. And so you have a lot of Victorian sensibilities, there's debutante balls, um, also arranged marriages, and a lot of fantasy tropes like Ava. But it also has like laser, you know, guns <laughs> and whatnot left over. And then um, False Hearts has a lot of mystery and thriller elements, but I set it in near future San Francisco about 100 years from now. So I was able to keep a lot of what I knew since I grew up near San Francisco, but I could also have fun postulating what it would be like in the century. <laughs> who's, who's the siren? <laughs> All right, that's, that's <laughs> I'll shut my window. <laughs> All right, um, my turn. Uh, I, for for me, um, living in the uh, practically practically on the other side of the world from most of you guys, uh, Philippine literature is really a question of liter literary fiction, kind of intertwined with uh, magical realism. So there's a lot of these sort of Gabriel Gabriel um, Garcia Marquez mixed in. To our, to our reading, and growing up, that's really something that I really took after. And mix that with, you know, horror, which is something that I've always loved as a kid. And what comes out is this weird mismatch of horror literary fiction, which I'm sure is not really something that most people get to read, mm -hmm. and based on like it's based on a, on a perspective of what most people would usually consider the bad guy. So I, I I really really love the strange and the macabre and the just a little bit grotesque because when I I'm always asked to describe my uh, the girl from the well I always say that it's like a horror it's a literary horror story with a love story kind of mix into the pages but minus the romance so uh, you know it's a little bit difficult to explain unless you kind of get into the minds of my, my characters and trying to figure out you know how how things progress and um, it's really trying to find the weirdness of something and mixing it into something that we normally consider maybe young adult genre like fantasy and horror but always um, in my case I'm always trying to appreci appreciate the strangeness that I could find in those stories and kind of bringing it to life and giving people more uh, more insights on how to appreciate something that is not necessarily familiar and you know conforming Yeah, that makes sense. Um, did you come across problems when describing your manuscript, or even when querying or promoting the book? 
Um, I know for me, my biggest problem was before I knew how to classify it for myself. So basically, while I was first drafting, I was thinking the entire time, like, is this science fiction? Is this fantasy? And that was before a lot of the world building stuff was worked out, so it was harder to figure out then. Um, but once I had gotten through more revisions and I did a lot more research on what exactly is the dividing line between fantasy and science fiction, because it can be kind of blurred sometimes, um, then it became a lot easier because I you know, came to realize, okay, this is definitely science fiction, there's no magic, it's very technological, and things could all potentially happen based off you know, science rather than some other magical element. So once I put that together and started querying, um, I didn't really have any problems after that. It was just more of figuring out how to pick the genre for myself. For me, um the the problem sort of uh, people still do shelve the book as sci-fi on Goodreads, and I find that people who read it looking for sci-fi because they see time travel, they're like, oh, sci-fi. They are disappointed because there's like very little science. And it's funny, I actually wrote a time travel piece once. Um, it was a musical theater piece, and it was totally science-based, like really physics-heavy, and like talking about you know loops, lines and the cylinders, all that stuff, but this is not at all that. And um, I, my agent described it best when she said like, that her initial pitch was, it's time travel, but not what you think, because uh, <laughs> it's like, that's like the only way to describe it. Like, it's really heavy on time travel, but it is not at all sci -fi. So mm -hmm. even she was a little bit um, like trying to work on exactly how to pitch that element of it. Um, but it is what it is, and I, I, don't, um, I don't think it was negatively impacted by that too much, but it was definitely a, a little bit of a blip on the, on the, uh, right out the gate. Okay, I think we lost Catherine, so okay. Laura, and we'll go back to Catherine when she comes back. Okay, um, so for me, I went kind of a different way than Ava, Ava in that, um, the inhabitants of my world think that the technology is magic and to them it may as well be magic. So I ended up classifying it eventually more fantasy, but I did initially query it through Angry Robots Open Door as adult sci-fi, which was basically the opposite of what it was marketed <laughs> as. So I knew nothing, Jon Snow. Um, and I wasn't really sure what... I knew that um, False Hearts was sci-fi, but interestingly the marketing of it, at least in the UK, is much more focusing on the thriller aspect. So they call it near future thriller rather than science fiction to try and kind of access that larger crime market and things like that. So it's quite interesting. But querying pantomime especially was hard because one, I wasn't very good at querying, and two, um, the pronouns were difficult as well because my main character is Micah. So I was trying to have it like half as she pronouns and half as he pronouns, and now in retrospect I could have just used they pronouns, but back in 2011 they weren't really having those sort of discussions as much. Um, so, yeah. Like, really, so basically, yeah, I didn't really know what to market or query anything else. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> kind of like the later on. Catherine, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> internet just totally shut out. So I'm now on my neighbor's internet. Um, <laughs> I have their password. It's fine. They know. <laughs> <laughs> so this was whether we had a difficulty classifying our book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, marketing, marketing the book, querying the book. Yes. Um, I didn't query with this book. So I queried my agent first with a historical horror paranormal thing that she rejected and then I queried her with my new adult romance so this I didn't have to query and I'm really glad because I have no idea what I would call this um, my agent and my editor call it historical fantasy I usually describe it with, as historical with a splash of fantasy because the fantasy is so light Mm -hmm. uh, I am really curious to see where they shelve this next year. I assume it'll be on teen fantasy and adventure in Barnes and Noble, but it might end up on just regular teen fiction, which is where they sell the contemporary and historical books. Uh, I don't know where they're going to shelve this. I 
used to worry about this a lot, and then I stopped worrying about it because my job is not to market the book. That's somebody else's job. That's sort of why I do this. And so I've just let go, and I've sold one book like this, so I know that I can sell others like this, hopefully. Um, so I'm just going to keep writing my books, and somebody else will figure out how to put Catherine Locke's books on that bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my on that. All right. Um, for me, I think the biggest mistake that I made when I was querying was pitching it as a straight-out ghost story. And in the course of my querying, I kind of realized that there is a major difference between the uh, American ghost story and the Japanese ghost story that I was trying to 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 write, because American horror stories are more like the TV series, uh, you know, those uh, gore, lots of gore, lots of jump scares, lots of, you know, maybe chasing people around, whereas Japanese ghost stories tend to be more of a slow, bur slow burn. So that's more like a tragedy sometimes than it comes off as an actual ghost story. And I was fortunate enough that my agent got it. I mean, she really, really got it. And was she was able to sort of explain to me that hey this is how we're going to treat her manuscript and this is how we're gonna fit differently from say a lot of other ghost stories that are out on the mission right now and the next hurdle that we sort of uh, we sort of found was that um, we had like half of the publishers that we were querying wanting us to keep it as like a young, uh, a really toned down version of the book that I was writing and keep it strictly like young adult, like age 10, 11 and up that they could be, that, that uh, be for further readers and the, we have the other half of the publisher saying, no, we got to treat this like an adult fiction because, and, and even even though we're gonna amp up all the gore, we're gonna add, you know, those those typical American elements into the story. And for a first time writer who didn't really know what she was what she was doing at that time, like in, in terms of submitting to American publishing companies, I was very lost and I didn't, didn't really know what I was supposed to do. But once again my agent came in and she sort of saved the day and said, you know what, we're gonna we're not gonna stop until we find the publisher that really wants to keep the book the way it is right now. Because from my point of view, it's a very unique book with a, a really odd perspective that I think people would like for, you know, for the novelty of it, as well as the really nice, well, obviously the really nice story that comes along with it. And she finally convinced me uh, to keep waiting until we find that right publisher who's willing to take the book as it is. And again, I was very lucky in that regard because I was able to publish my book pretty much in the same with the same vision that I had when I first wrote it. Yep. Very good agent. <laughs> <laughs> very Hard very much. Be. Her name's Rebecca Podos. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to thank her because your book gave me nice and the poetry in it just was excellent. So I'll thank, have you. thank you. Um sometimes the spe uh, speculative genre of the mixture is seen as less worthy or deemed somehow inferior. For example, um, The Buried Giant by Kazuo Ishiguro, uh, a fantasy book that was shelved as literary fiction and how some readers' expectations were unmet because of that, like Heidi mentioned. Do you think cross-gender books can suffer from these preconceived ideas? Um, yeah, I definitely think so. Basically, what Heidi was mentioning earlier, how, how a book is marketed can have a huge impact on how readers um, pick up that book and what they're expecting when they go in. I think the biggest ones I've seen that have caused like conflict with readers has been between fantasy and historical fiction, kind of like Katie was saying, uh, because 
fantasy, you know, we have these high pace and lots of magic, and like they they go in expecting that, and if it ends up being more on the historical fiction side, where it has a lot of less of those elements, but it was marketed as, you know, especially fantasy, then sometimes, you know, readers can come out feeling like, well, this wasn't really what I was expecting, wasn't really what I wanted. And I've seen that with um, a couple books who's, that's come out this year, which I haven't read yet, but have that crossover where they were expecting a lot um, more heavy fantasy and got more of a historical element that they weren't really expecting, which doesn't mean it was necessarily, you know, a bad book or anything, but it wasn't what they wanted when they picked it up, and it wasn't what they were told they were going to get when they picked it up. So I think it can be an issue, but it's not necessarily because of the book. It's just how the book is marketed. Um, it's funny. I, you know, you, you, the part of the question was about whether or not the, um, like, the speculative part is less worthy. And I think, it, like, I, I had the same experience. Uh, uh, like, uh, I agree with Ava, basically. I think, like, for me, I never find, like, uh, fantasy, like, less worthy or anything. Like, I am a total nerd for fantasy <laughs> and, like, sci-fi and all that, like, the genre stuff. So when I, like, and it's weird because the book, my book is, like, actually kind of still light on fantasy. It's still light on, it's like a father-daughter story. And so it's mm -hmm. mostly, um, people pick it up and they're like, oh, it's going to be, you know, swashbuckling and this and that. That and like mythical, magical things, but it's really a historical um, book, and it's about like the downfall of Hawaii, and it's about this father and this daughter, and and I think that uh, I think that sometimes it does cause a little bit of um, of like maybe not disappointment, but like a like a, a, a expectations weren't met. I haven't had problems with people being like I hated it, but like I definitely have problems with people being like, oh, that wasn't what I expected. Um, but uh, but not because of the fantasy being too much, but because of the fantasy being too like little. Mm -hmm. um, I have not yet gone through edits with a girl with a red balloon, so I actually expect this to change because it was one of the things my editor brought up on the phone call when um, we were discussing the book was that the same thing. The fantasy element is so small, I suspect she's going to want me to elevate that, um, which is typical for me. I only like to write one magical thing in a book, and then I kind of let the world build and go like, well, I don't know. Ah. <laughs> um, so I, that, that was something that came up when editors were reading, is that the fantasy element wasn't big enough. So that expectations weren't met in that way. Um, do I think it's going to suffer from that? Or do I think it has suffered from that? I think it has suffered more from not being fantasy enough than it has been for having fantasy um, in terms of my experience on submission. And then I worry a lot, like I said, about using magic and fantasy in historical because these are real people's lives and I don't want, ironically my book is about tampering with history and I am very, very sensitive to tampering with history. Um, so I think that's where my concerns about reader expectations and uh, reception of the novel come, but I don't actually think it suffers from having a little bit of fantasy in it. And I think that that perception is really something that happens in adult fiction and much less in mm. young adult fiction where fantasy is like a rite of passage. It's a way, like, tons of teens love fantasy. It's pretty much a genre that has remained strong regardless of the market. So I think I see that more in adult fiction, which maybe Laura can talk about, than I see in young adult fiction. Yeah, I think young adult gives us a lot more like room to blend genres because a lot of the time it'll just be the YA section of the bookstore and everything will be kind of all mixed up together anyway. Um, for me, when I initially submitted Pantomime, I got an edit letter um, and they wanted me to add more magic, which to be fair was fine because I really had very little as well and I think bulking it up made both Pantomime more interesting and Shadow Play and Masquerade. I honestly now don't know what I would have done in the sequels <laughs> if I'd had as little magic as I did in the first one. Um, and one thing that 
really annoys me is the kind of literary snobbery when it comes to genre because um, mm -hmm. like so much of the literary canon is, is actually sci-fi and fantasy. And uh, it's like once it's old enough, they're like, okay, now it can be literature like Frankenstein. Even though Frankenstein is totally sci-fi. Um, <laughs> and in the animal side, I'm kind of interested to see how False Hearts is received because it is, you know, being pitched as quite crime heavy and a lot of crime readers are reading it who don't read science fiction or fantasy. So it's kind of interesting to see like how accessible they'll find, you know, my wall screens and my hover cars and my brain implants. Um, <laughs> along with the crime. So we'll see. Okay. Um, well, with, with, with me, it's not so much as what I was writing in horror, so much as how I was writing it. Because I wrote horror in a sort of literary fiction sort of way, and there was some consternation with a lot of publishers that we approached because they didn't think that something like that was going to be very uh, li like a lot of people were willing to read literary fiction much much less horror literary fiction which was very weird concept blend and I I can only say that in the Philippines as much as there's a lot of literary fiction here and in fact that's one of the the bigger branches, the bigger genres here, there is a small group of speculative fiction writers who are really, really fighting and doing their best to kind of push speculative fiction forward and try to, they're like trying to argue that speculative fiction deserves at least the same kind of respect and the same kind of recognition that literary fiction is enjoying here. And that there is more than one way, one way to write a book. And literary fiction is just one aspect, and speculative fiction is just as equally good as, at, at it. And in, in a country that's really, really entrenched in literary fiction, you know, given that I do kind of write in the literary style, it's very heartening to see like-minded like people who are really doing their best, like, short story writers, no, no, novella writers, novels, a uh, novelist, uh, they, they're really looking at American fiction as they see it now and are really getting encouraged by the rise of all these, you know, like speculative fiction in the United States and in other countries. And they're really hoping and really fighting for, for you know, trying to get speculative fiction realized here as well and it's actually pretty good it's actually working because uh, slowly but surely a lot of writers here are getting recognition they're re they're winning local awards over literary fiction sometimes and uh, I mean coming from my perspective all I can really say is it's it's a really good time to be writing speculative fiction because um, the interest, at least here in the Philippines, is climbing, and you know, the the more there's out there, the better. Cool. Um, do you do you think genres should be more lax? Different methods of shelving and marketing books or simply more genre names like dark fantasy or science fantasy? Um, I mean, I feel like genres are already pretty lax from what I've seen. There's, at least in YA, there's a lot of room, like Laura was saying, to mix around. Mm -hmm. And generally, things will get shelved under what they are most like. So, you know, this is mostly fantasy, but it also has elements of mystery and science fiction or whatever. So, I mean, I feel like in terms of restrictions, it's not necessarily as restrictive as some people think might think it is. Um, so I feel like it's okay. I think it's more of a like self-determined thing where writers need to figure out when they're querying anyway, like what they most fit into first for themselves before they start querying. And after that, it's yeah, people kind of will work with you to put your book wherever it fits best. I think that for me anyway, marketing is such a, an opaque thing <laughs> to me that I, I can't really tell 
I, I, I'm not sure if I buy books the way that everyone else buys them or if I buy them differently. Like, I usually go through, like, um, just, you know, not only people that I like, but um, I, I don't usually go to bookstores, like, and, like, just kind of browse. I, like, Google things, and I, like, say, what's, like, this that I liked? And I... And I think that as the information age at least becomes more, um, like, as, like, keywords and all these things become more, like, available to everyone, then we can search in new ways for books. I think that we'll find a lot more of, like, it, like genre blending becoming easier. Like, you can really, I know it's, like, terrible to admit, but, like, I buy a lot of books online and on my e-reader. and like, But, you know, living in a studio, you have such a small space. But, um, you know, you can really find things that can, um, that by whatever keyword they're, they have on them, so they can be both sci-fi and fantasy, and then whatever you're, whatever you're looking for, you can just kind of, um, I don't know, it, you can then dive into it and find these other elements, uh, and it really helps broaden your um, your reading list. I've found that I've really enjoyed books that I uh, that I picked up for one reason, and then they turned out to be something else. So um, I don't think things need to be more. Um, lax or less lax. I just think that we're finding new ways to discover books all the time and um, and I think that that's helpful. I agree. Most of my book recommendations now come through Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. One way I'm like, well I yeah. have to go look all these books because I saw on Twitter that they came out today or I knew they were coming out today. So a lot of my book recommendations are coming through Twitter. Um, I, at least in my Barnes and Noble, which is the the only bookstore near me within like an hour right now, um, there's teen fiction, then there's teen fantasy and adventure, and then there's teen romance. And mm -hmm. the difference between teen fantasy and event or teen fantasy and teen fiction doesn't bother me, but the teen romance does bother me. And I want that back into regular teen fiction for a couple of reasons. One, I think that teen romance books are regular fiction. <laughs> Being against separating that. Um, and B, because it really drives me crazy that queer romance in YA is not shelved under YA contemporary romance. It's shelved under regular fiction. So I think as we're seeing more queer based stories, I want to see all of that integrated so that somebody might pick up Simon and not know it's about a gay teen and just read it because it was in regular fiction and it was next to a book that they loved and it was also in the So either integrating queer fiction into teen romance or moving all of romance back into YA teen fiction would be my ideal. Um, in terms of how we market books, I think we've gotten very lax. Like, yeah. And I'm totally okay with this. I don't mind at all. I don't see um, marketing departments and Twitter accounts like Epic Reads or Quarters Reads doing things like um, they're not labeling books in their tweets or in their marketing materials. They're describing yeah. So they're describing books like Heidi's as you know, a time travel, about a historical, that there's maps, um, that it's about a girl and her father. So they're describing books more and um, labeling them less. And I, I like that. I think it makes uh, genre books, those so science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction, much more accessible to readers who otherwise are reading contemporary or more realistic fiction. It makes them have a gateway so that they're uh, not as, like, well, I don't read science fiction. Oh, I might pick up that because I like reading father-daughter stories, and that sounds like it might be up my alley. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think that we move towards less labels, and that's better. And uh, Yeah, I agree that I think the last labels work quite well. Um, in the false arts is kind of a weird beast that's hard to categorize. Um, but the fact that they're still, you know, marketing it quite well, thank you, publicist, um, and the fact that it's getting out there and getting reviewed in both uh, mainstream, like I, I was in Heat Magazine in the UK, which is quite big, and I was also in like SFX, 
So they've they've done a really good job of trying to hit both like the general reading public and sci-fi because I do think sci-fi is going pretty mainstream. Uh, you know, like 20 years ago, it was maybe considered a bit more weird to read science fiction and fantasy, but now like everyone watches Game of Thrones and everyone's seen Divergent, and so I think a lot more people are more willing to kind of jump, especially like kind of gateway books where it's like a little bit of sci-fi or a little bit of fantasy. Um, but bridged with historical fiction or thriller or something like that. Um, but I don't worry too much, again, about marketing because I don't really know that much about it. It's not really my thing. I tweet about my books occasionally and say, please buy them in not so many words. <laughs> and that's about the extent of what I do. Um, so, And, again, I, I get most of my book recs through Twitter or through my friends, so I don't know if, like, Tech, technical like marketing advertising revenue really like works on me per se. Maybe it does and I don't realize it. <laughs> <laughs> Book idea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't really say much about how books are organized in the U.S., but in the Philippines, we're actually like the world's number one user of social media accounts, which is surprising that we're all one of the kind of the worst internet as you can probably hear now. <laughs> um, <Aww. laughs> yeah. uh, the thing about a lot of things that we're really sociable and social media accounts are a way of keeping track with people to the point that you know you're not really I mean, a lot of people say, you know, if you have a, if you have an internet connection, not really Filipino, unless you have like a Facebook account, and you know where, where all your friends are in, and we we also have like a lot of Filipinos on Goodreads. I think they're like one of the one of one of the like major demographics there. And the thing about Filipinos is that when they really appreciate something, when they really like a book they really want to help it spread through word of mouth too and um, when it comes to I guess classifying them as a certain kind of fantasy or a certain kind of science fiction they don't really it don't, it really matters to them much so uh, it, what what's really important is that they like the book and if their friends recommend it and that's you know in, in a lot of cases that's just that's good enough for them so it's not. I, I'm. I don't think that he, at, at least here in the Philippines, it's not really the classification of books that's important. It's how many friends you like that also like the book and will, you know, do everything in their willpower to like force the book in your face until you actually pick it up and read it them. So that that's how you know really social and how we ask some people here are about their books. I've always noticed that on Twitter is that the Philippines book community is so active and lively and supportive. Oh, yeah. It's really so I've noticed Singapore as well. I've yeah. Singapore as well. It's cool. Yeah, it's really neat. Yeah. <laughs> mm, what, gen uh, what genres would you like to see mixed more often? Do you have ideas? I have two answers to this, and not because it's not done already, it is, but just because I love it. Um, science fantasy is awesome. It mixes my two favorite loves into one, so mm -hmm. probably why I wrote a sort of science fantasy-ish thing. Um, also, but literary plus spec thick is so cool. I love it when I see that, when I can admire like the writing as much as I'm admiring the story. Not that I don't otherwise, but when you get a book that is just like really beautifully written and is also packed with action and magic and all sorts of things, it's just like my favorite thing ever. And uh, an example of that, which is an old one, is Shatter Me by Tahira Mafi. I don't know how many of you have read this. It's a young adult dystopian novel, but the writing is like writing poetry. It is fantastic, and it's not actual poetry, but it's it's really hard to describe if you haven't read, and I feel like it's one of those love-hate things. I've seen readers who just didn't like that kind of style, but if you like seeing like really literary Writing books like Shatter Me are awesome. Again, I'm just fighting off of what you said, but uh, science uh, science fantasy is really amazing to me. I love that sort of thing. That um, that's one of the reasons I think I loved your book so much. I love Beyond the Rift. Thanks. And, <laughs> and sort of like the oh the uncertain 
grasping of the throne and like and yet he's like you know stands and uh, uh things I can't <laughs> but you know what I mean like all this stuff that's going on yeah. and um I think another one I really love is uh it's like like science historical sort of like I don't want to say I know some people hate the word steampunk but like I love that sort of thing like where it's <laughs> science based and like it's also set in like a historical world um like kind of like uh uh um Mackenzie Lee's uh uh, this monstrous thing, or Tara Sims Timekeeper, which I was lucky enough to read and is coming out soon. But any of those, like, historical, or, or like, that's historical, like, fantasy, but also there's, like, a little bit of, like, a sci-fi sci feel because there's the mechanics and stuff of the clocks. But um, all those sort of sorts of things I really adore. So. Um, I would love to take book recommendations on Twitter if anyone has read anything like this. But I am still searching for a fantasy psychological thriller, so something with that's like Gone Girl esque, but fantasy. I'm desperate. Um, Have you read Borderline by Michelle Baker? Yes. So something I think that's yeah. kind of closer. Yeah. Not so quite psychological thriller, but I loved that book because it felt so different. Yeah, exactly. So I want something that's like really twisty and mind-bendy, very introspective, but with magic, because again, <laughs> I like better with magic. Uh, so that's what I'm, I'm looking for. I am not the writer to write that. I am not good at plotting, and you have to be good at plotting to do that. Um, <laughs> so that's not something that I will be writing, but that is what I'm looking for. And that's, I also think that that is a... Um, with the rise of, of science fiction and fantasy in more popular reading and the rise of psychological thrillers like Gone Girl, I actually think that that's something in five to ten years that we're going to be seeing on the market. Um, I keep saying the market, like the market. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that that's something that we're going to see meshing together. Um, as both of these things rise in popularity, whereas like ten years ago, this was like a, those were really niche genres. Mm. I really want a fantasy psychological thriller now. <laughs> I'm not. Like, I'm looking at. I'm mentally looking at my book list, like my books to write. Cube, being like, hmm. yeah, yeah, because <laughs> um, I used to think I wouldn't be able to write a thriller. In fact, one time I joked to my friend with Wesley Chu. I was like, ha, 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 can you imagine me writing a science fiction thriller? Because <laughs> <laughs> I used to think I was really bad at plotting, but I guess, like, I don't know, maybe I'm not as, like, bad as I thought I was at it. So, yay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I really like steampunk, too, and I find it kind of sad that it seems to be hard for it to be really taking off in literature. Like, mm -hmm. the aesthetic's really popular in cons and things, but you haven't really had too many breakaway successes. There was um, Bone Shaker, looking at my shelves. Bone Shaker by Sherry Priest did quite well, but um, it seems to be something that's hard to gain traction. Mm -hmm. um, I also really like literary fiction mixed with speculative elements. Like Margaret Atwood's still one of my favorites, even though it annoys me. She's like, it's not sci-fi. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and other things like that. I'm trying to think of other ones. I'm like twisting around at my bookshelves, being like, hmm. Um, but yeah, science fantasy is one of my favorites as well, where you're not quite sure if it's magic or if it's technology or if it could be both. Um, and I like playing with the line between magic and tech um, because it's really just how much the people in that world understand it. its mechanisms because probably even like the most fantasy of fantasy would somehow have some sort of physics base as we just wouldn't really know what it was or how to, how to describe it in technical terms, I suppose. But yeah, mush together all the things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, uh, well, another fan of science fantasy here, and also of <laughs> steampunk. And um, as as far as I'm concerned, the weirder it is, all the better. Like if somebody comes up to you and says, "No, there's no possible way like these two genres can can mix well together." I, I mean, my my first instinct would always be, "Yes." Th then I, I want now I want to go 
and do that thing. And, you know, the, the stranger and the more unique it sounds, the more I kind of want to read it. Something around the, like, I don't know, maybe Aboriginal steampunk or uh, <laughs> maybe like a, a, a contemporary love story romance written by Charles Buk Bukowski or something. Mm -hmm. Something that's so kind of unique that the genre alone kind of catches your attention. That's that's really something that I would love to, a book that I would love to get my hands on. Another fan of steampunk, I think it's one of the genres that suffers the most with this because, for example, Sherry Priest's books are shelved as science fiction while Gail Carriger's books are shelved as uh, historical books. So, mm -hmm. you, steampunk is all, all over the place. You don't know if it's science, science fantasy, historical fantasy. You know, it kind of suffers a bit. Alternate like history. That. like uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 But that's why I like it, because it is such a mishmash. Yes, true. I agree. <laughs> Uh, okay, so which books would you like to recommend for someone who wants to try mixed genre stories? I know some of you have already mentioned some books, but give them some focus now. Yeah, so I already mentioned Shatter Me, so I'm not going to mention that one again. But that one does blend genre as well as literary stuff, so cool things. Um, this is a super obvious one that basically everyone has read the whole series except me, but Cinder. Yeah, it's very science fiction, but it's a retelling of Cinderella. I'm not going to go on about this one. I'm pretty sure anyone watching this probably already knows about it. Um, but also Love in the Time of Global Warming by Francesca Leo Block I recently read. And this is a post-apocalyptic story, but it has a lot of really weird, like, odyssey, like, the and um, by Homer and fantasy stuff blended into it, where it, I think this is, like, the most mishmashiest book I've read in, like, this year, probably. And probably in a while before that, but it was really good and definitely very blendy and unusual for a post-apocalyptic book, plus has some of the literary cool writing stuff that I liked in it too, so recommended. Um, so I, you know, I mentioned Timekeeper before and um, also uh, This Monstrous Thing um, by Mackenzie Lee, and uh, the one other one I would really, that I would mention, I'm sure everyone here has read it, or almost everyone at least, um, because I talk about it so much, but The Abyss Surrounds Us is, I think it's a literary and sci-fi. It's very, like, there's, like, this, like, Nietzsche and, like, this philosophical stuff in it, and it's also, like, pirates and sea monsters and, like, uh, you know, post-global warming. And it's a really great book. I, think that, uh, I would recommend that one. Anyone, really. Um, but, yeah. Um, I'm just scanning my bookshelves again. Me too. I keep being like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> over here, like, and of course I alphabetized everything because Dahlia Adler said she was going to kill me if I didn't. And <laughs> but now I can't find anything. Um, <laughs> books that I would recommend Bone Gap. Oh, yes. Like, mm -hmm. incredible. I don't know how Laura Ruby describes it in terms of genre. I think I would probably call it like literary fantasy. I don't really want to use magical realism because that comes out of a different tradition and but like it's close. Like I don't know what it is. But it's very wonderful and beautiful and I would highly recommend it. Um, Laura Lamb's YA is all getting new covers and they are incredible books, and I'm so glad that they're getting a second breath of life. They were some of the first queer YA that I ever read, and I am, I, they just do so much for the YA community. Just from that perspective, but also, I think they're really, <laughs> for when they were published, they really broke out of the genre. Uh, I remember reading them and being like, can she do this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that those two books are very different, um, but they also show what you can do in YA these days, and I think that that's a really great thing. <laughs> It is kind of interesting to see like how they're being marketed differently now because they sold in 2012 and that was kind of before We Need Diverse books really got going um, and beforehand like the first time around they were like what do we do with the intersex thing I don't know 
Um, whereas the new publishers are like, here it is on the blurb instead of hidden. <laughs> it's like a twist. Um, so that's nice. So I'm, I'm excited to see it get re-released in paperback. Um, for me, uh, I like, if you like steampunk, go for The Falconer by Elizabeth May because it's set in steampunk Edinburgh. And Elizabeth is my friend and my co-writer. We're writing a ladies kicking ass sci-fi book hey. at the moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's like Mad Max in space. It's yes. Really cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Falconer is steampunk Edinburgh with a lot of fae and folklore elements and the main character is a debutante by day and then kills fairies by night in revenge. <laughs> and she engineers her own weapons and she's really like badass and cool. And uh, Elizabeth study has a PhD in anthropology and folklore, so she's drawing on a lot of the like Scottish tradition and did a lot of research into being period uh, accurate with both the language of Gaelic and you know the time period. So it hits that sweet historical fantasy steampunky note. Ren, are you there? Ren. <laughs> While we're waiting for Ren, I have one more recommendation. It's not okay. okay. Oh, oh, yay. Okay. <laughs> Am I here? <laughs> Can yes. you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Yes. Sorry about that. My, no as I said, my internet's not really working very well right now. Um, well, for me, I really second This Monstrous Thing by Mackenzie Lee because that is really awesome. Like Steampunk Frankenstein, that is one of the things that I really, really love about you know mixing genres, the, the weird and wonderful things that you can come up with. And um, I, I would say that I really, really want Catherine Valente to be my, my spirit animal because she is so amazing when it comes to writing. And I really recommend her her fairy Fairyland series, starting with uh, The Girl Who okay. Circumnavigated Fairyland with the ship of her own making. It is one of, you know, it, it really blew my mind. It's one of the things that made me really love the, the whole concept of, you know, blending fairy tales and the, these, like, it's a bit material and a lot of literary fiction done right. And I, you know, I, I, I'm, well, I'm, I'm really speechless when it comes to a lot of her books from, you know, Deathless and Palimpsest. It, if you really want to start out with something that's so profound, I really recommend her. Mm. Catherine, you had one more book to recommend? Yes. Winter Spell by Claire Legrand mm -hmm. um, is a nutcracker retelling, so it's historical with fantasy, and uh, it's one of the most beautiful and dark nutcracker retellings I've ever seen. Um, it's like... It's based on a really dark ballet version of the Nutcracker that used to be put on by the Pacific Northwest Ballet. Um, so I highly recommend that one, too, in terms of seeing something that uh, starts out really purely historical and then, like, with a crash goes into fantasy. Okay. Okay, so we have time to one more question, so I'm going to pick one from the audience. Corinne asks... If you experienced any resistance to genre blending, whether from agents, editors, or reviewers, especially when it gets weird, anyone who wanted one or another wanted it to be more easily defined or got straight up confused? Um, I think the only resistance I had was while I was querying, and initially when we first went on submission, Beyond the Red was pitched as New Adult, because at the time, New Adult spec pick was something that looked like it might happen. Um, but I'm glad we decided against it, because that did not happen, and <laughs> it fits as Young Adult really well. So, I mean, that was really the only resistance we had, and it ended up being a good thing. So that's just about it, basically, for me, anyway. You know, for me, um, kind of the resistance like came from my own head. Okay, my baby's yelling at me. Sorry, but um, just briefly, I had a hard time defining it myself and um, like defining what exactly I was writing, and it took me a while to figure it out. Um, I had to go through a lot of rewrites before I was even um, ready to query to figure out exactly what I was like 
writing in and how like I, it, I couldn't find comps. I like didn't know what exactly I was doing because I guess I didn't I, I didn't think about genre before I started putting pen to paper. Um, mm -hmm. That's my own fault. Uh, but um, but again, it, it turned out okay. Um, uh, everyone else kind of who was I guess who was interested in the piece I feel like is pretty genre forgiving. Um, like I said before, the only pushback that I had was that there wasn't enough fantasy. Um, and I had pushback on the Holocaust element, but I did not have any pushback on the fact that I uh, combined history and fantasy together. Um, I hope that I don't get any. <laughs> I'm pretty early in the process with my blended, my blended book. My new adults were pretty straightforward contemporary romance. So that's it for me. I think I had probably less than you'd expect, considering how kind of off the wall my books tend to be <laughs> like, like tradition. So, um, Pantomime ended up technically being like the first submission for the now departed Strange Chemistry Young Adult Arm, and they were on the whole fairly supportive, and they didn't seem bothered by the fact that it was sci-fi slash fantasy. They just said like we're gonna market it as fantasy because the sci-fi is not. The focus it is more fantasy focused, and um, they were kind of confused as to how to market the whole intersex thing. Um, and I think, in retrospect, perhaps didn't take the best approach, but not really out of malice, just kind of out of ignorance and being unsure how to go about it. Like I can kind of see how they thought keeping the intersex part as the twist would kind of make people talk about it more, but it also made it hard for me to talk about what the book was actually about. Um, so that was probably the only kind of difficulty I had. And uh, when I was writing False Hearts, I thought it was so weird. I kept calling it Bonkers Book. <laughs> I thought it would never, I, I wasn't sure if it was going to sell because it is like cults and brain hacking and, you know, formerly conjoined twins. And a lot of, there's a lot going on in the book, which a few people have commented on. Um, but it turns out it was actually pretty commercial. So. That surprised me. <laughs> Rin? All right. Okay. Um, well, I did mention it before that uh, I was having, you know, trouble trying to position what exa what exactly is this ghost ghost story slash horror novel I'm going to, to write, and. Like like I did mention, I did mention that there were some publishers who didn't really know how to place it in the first place. There were others who kind of wanted it for their kids list and didn't really want all the additional gore. And then there were others who felt that uh, it it would be more fitting if they somehow kind of put it on the uh, the adult section instead of the young adult genre. And um, you know you know despite all that, what I really kind of learned through the whole process of querying and submitting the manuscripts is that uh, when it all comes down to it, you really should just, you know, write what you want. Mm -hmm. I, I think some 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 wise dude said that, you know, write the the, the first the dra first draft is for you. The second draft is for everybody else. And I really stand by that advice. So you know, when when it comes to place worrying about whether or not your how they're gonna place your manuscript, um, and why like whether or not the genre that they finally decide for you might not necessarily be the one that you want, I, I'd say that at this point it's really just a question of what do you want to write, what, what um like what what's your vision for the book? Once your agent gets it and once your publisher gets it, I'm pretty sure that the rest just kind of, kind of follows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much to everyone who participated in the panel, to everyone who's watching. Uh, if you have any more questions, you can always tweet at us, and we'll try to get to them. And next, we have a panel about disability, so we'll see you in a moment. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>